My guest today on Front Row Rugby is Springbok legend Dick Muir. Dick, welcome to Front Row Rugby. It's lovely to have you here. Thank you very much, Peter. Nice to chat to you. Now, just before we get started, we're going to take a look at the trivia question for today. Let's take a look at that right now. Who was South Africa's leading point scorer at the 2011 Rugby World Cup? Now, I think Dick will know the answer to this one, but we'll find out at the end of our conversation if he does. In the meantime, you can put the answer, if you know it, in the comment section down below. Dick, we're going to start in 1997, let's say early in the year when you sort of joined Western Province. Uh, at that time, were you thinking that there was not much of a chance that you were going to get a Springbok call-up? Yeah, it was, uh, it, was, it was the end of my career, so... Uh... I went down to Western Province basically to uh, to uh, finish off my rugby career, and uh, and uh, it was just it came as a huge surprise, you know, when I when I got the call up finally, um, I did feel that uh, it could have happened a, a couple of years earlier, um, and uh, and it's just but but I was just overwhelmed by by getting the call up. I mean, you know, so many players end up missing out, and uh, and I nearly did as well. So it was great to eventually get the call up at uh, 33 or 32 years old I can't remember what it was talk to me about your debut against Italy yeah it was uh, it was an indifferent game uh, it was uh, Italy at that time weren't that strong uh, so we played played them in Bologna uh, the game was uh, didn't sort of get get a proper flow but uh, we had moments where we played some brilliant rugby and uh, and I think uh, you know it was a little bit of a nervous start. Uh, for me personally, but uh, but the game sort of got underway and we got away with quite a comfortable win against uh, Bologna. I mean, against Italy in Bologna, yeah. Hey, if you're enjoying this video, why not hit the like button? And you scored a try in that test match as well. And then again, the following week against France in Lyon. How special was it to uh, get a series win over the French that year? Yeah, it was, a, it was an amazing Springbok tour. You know, it was... Uh, it was one of those where it was uh, early days for Nick and uh, and obviously for a lot of us that, that came into that team uh, that were under Nick's selection. So, uh, you know, just the character sort of set high standards for, for the team. Uh, and there was pressure, you know, uh, on us uh, initially. And, uh, and, and once we sort of gained a little bit of momentum and the confidence grew, uh, it was a phenomenal team that we had, you know, and the guys just... Uh, believed in each other, we believed in the style that we were playing, and uh, and the results looked after themselves. You mentioned Nick Mallett coming in as the new coach, and that second test against the French, where we absolutely hammered them in Paris, 52-10. What was it about Nick Mallett's approach, do you think, that made that series for us so memorable? Well, uh, yeah, Nick, Nick had coached over there, so uh, he knew the French pretty well, he could speak the language. Uh, you know there was huge respect uh, shown to him by the by the uh, by the French, uh, but uh, but I think it was just uh, Nick Nick allowed the players to express themselves on the field. You know he he uh, he had this uh, tackle count, which was the one measure that he had. You know where where we sort of were pushing each other out of the way to 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 get into the front line and make the tackles to impress the coach type of thing but uh, but that was just one of the things the other the, the other thing is he was pretty hard on us uh, on where we made mistakes or where we could have been better uh, and I think that just drove the group you know and uh, and yeah there was a, a great team spirit amongst us all uh, and uh, yeah the rest is history eh. And in the following week, we were up against England. We took care of business at Twickenham uh, fairly routinely, as I recall. Uh, Clive Woodward had actually just become England's coach at the time. Um, as you remember it, how strong or weak were the English at the time? Yeah, the English were strong. The English were strong. Uh, Clive Woodward was, uh, was, was, was pretty vocal, uh, you know, in the lead up to, to that game. Uh, and, uh, yeah, it was a hard fought win. Uh, we got away with... Uh, with a reasonable margin against against England, but it was a tough game. It was uh, the conditions weren't great, uh, and and anyone at Twickenham is a, is is a good one, you know. But uh, but I must say the uh, the balance of the team was was really good, and uh, and the belief and, and and that's what accounts for a lot. Uh, you know, mentally we were a tough group, uh, and we drove each other pretty hard, you know. So uh, there there was a lot of fun that was had on the field. 
uh, and off the field, you know, uh, and that was part of their success. And then straight after that Twickenham test, we went to Scotland and we gave them a record hammering 68-10 at Murrayfield. Uh, James Small uh, still scored a try there to uh, become the all-time uh, Springbok try scorer at the time. Um, just given what happened that day at Murrayfield, uh, what was it about that Springbok squad, do you think, that was just so special? I think the, the balance was good. There was, a, there was a good balance between youth and experience. Uh, there were a lot of guys that uh, that knew each other pretty well, that had played with each other provincially. Uh, you know, so uh, I, I think of a guy like Henry Honeyball that was playing on my inside. You know, Andres Snaman on the outside. Uh, the back three were were well accomplished players. So yeah, there was a there was a really good balance uh, in that team and uh, and a lot of belief. And then that was also the end of your international career. How disappointed were you not to get another chance in 1998? I think I would have got a chance uh, had I not been injured in in in, this, in the build up to that. Uh, but uh, but yeah, that's how it goes. You know, you you've got to the fact that I just got a couple of caps was was great. You know, having played so many provincial games for for Natal and Western Province uh, at the time, it was uh, it was great to get a to finally get a, a call up for the Springboks. All right, Dick, I've had a couple of guys on the show who have told me that you were quite the prankster and joker uh, in the various squads that you played in. Um, to give you an idea, I had Val Bartman on the show quite early on uh, on Front Row Rugby, and he looked at me and he said, touring with Dick Muir could be very interesting. And the tone that he used, it almost came across as if he had been waiting for a very, very long time to tell someone this. I'm keen to hear from you. Why would he have said something like that? Yeah, I think our, our history just goes back, you know, Vol, Vol, uh, I must say all the guys that we played with were, were good guys. There were no real bad guys. And, uh, and, and it was fun. You know, we didn't play for the money. We didn't play for anything else, but just for the... Uh, for for your teammates and and for for donning the jersey, so that was that was what it was really about, you know. So, yeah, we had we had plenty fun on the fields, uh, you know. Some of the the sort of challenges where Val and I would have got into one or two challenges was uh, he was probably the slowest loose forward uh, to have played for South Africa, and I was probably the slowest back to have ever played for loose forward. And he he thought he was quicker than me, but. Uh, uh, you know, I knew I had the edge on ball. You know, so, but uh, no, we had we had many many. We toured we toured a lot. We played a lot of games together, and uh, and Vol was one of those very, very special leaders that uh, that uh, led by example, and uh, and didn't say much. You know, his uh, his sort of motivational was sort of speech was come on, eh? you know, and that just meant one hell of a lot. You know, just in that uh, sort of short little statement. Uh, but everybody knew what that meant, you know, and uh, yeah, we, we, we shared some very fond memories. All right. If anybody wants to go and watch that Vol Bartman interview, I'll actually put a link up to it over here and you can click on that and go check it out. Uh, Dick, um, on the practical joke side of things, is there a funny or memorable moment that you can share with us? Wow. There's a good, there's a good few, but, uh, but talking about that sort of era, uh, you know, the one, the one that, uh, that springs to mind was, uh, you know, we were we were the dirt trackers on on a Springbok tour, and we it was Andre Marcroft's time when he was the head coach, and Nick was uh, uh, sort of the the dirt trackers uh, coach, and uh, and we were touring in France, and we ended up playing against the French Barbarians, and we lost that game, and and uh, and we didn't play particularly well, uh, but you know, one of the things that that people will talk about forever was Nick Mallett's uh, post-match uh, uh, reviews when uh, when you lost. You know, he, he really tore a strip off you and he he, uh, he took it quite personally. And, and, and so we knew we were in for a rough, a rough video session after lunch. And uh, while we were at lunch, we, we popped a, a couple of sleeping tablets into his meal. And we, uh, we got into the team room and we sort of we closed all the curtains. We made it really dark, and uh, it was it was just one hell of a funny thing to see this guy wanting to tear a strip off you, pushing the sort of fast forward button, and then going all the way to the end of the video, and then like waking up halfway through his sort of sentence, and then 
You know, he was completely out of it. But uh, hats off to Nick. You know, he fought he fought his way through that video session, and uh, and anyway, we we jumped on the bus afterwards, and uh, we were going to do a, a a sort of captain's run before we played our next match. And Nick turned to the management and sort of said, I, "I don't know what these players are complaining about. You know, they can't really sleep. You know, I could just drop off, I could just drop off like this. You know." And he sort of sat back in his chair and he fell asleep. And when we got to the practice field, if the media weren't there to meet him, uh, we would have left him on the bus and done done the captain's practice ourselves and sort of jumped back on the bus and headed back to the hotel, you know. But but uh, there was so much media waiting for him that we woke him up and he was sort of stumbling along as these guys were trying to interview him, walking through puddles. And, uh, yeah, it was, it was quite a funny occasion. Sounds like it. Uh, so, Dick, something that my viewers love to know is the following. Who was your toughest opponent? Wow, there were many. Uh, yeah, the the probably internationally, Philip Seller was uh, was probably the guy that, uh, that 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 I found to be the toughest opponent. Uh, yeah, and then uh, and then you know on the local scene, probably a guy like a Yarpy Mulder was 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 a tricky customer uh, in in you know in, in the domestic sort of competition. And then, Dick, another thing, you only got to play five test matches for the Springboks. Many kids dream of playing for the box, obviously growing up playing provincial rugby or school rugby, obviously before that. But when they think of playing for the box, I think that they think they're going to play 100 tests or they're going to play for a decade. And as I say, in your case, it was only five test matches. What would your advice be to those youngsters? Yeah, it's, it's, it's sort of the ultimate. Uh, uh, it's the ultimate to play for your country. So... If you can, if you can achieve it and play one minute, it's fantastic. If you end up playing a couple of games or end up playing a hundred games, it's, it's equally special, you know, just to be able to to put on the the Springbok jersey and uh, represent your country in that way, you know. So, yeah, I can just say, and 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 uh, and if I could make it, they could make it, you know. Uh, would would be the advice. Uh, hard work uh, is going to get you there. Uh, and uh, and if you've given it your all and you don't achieve it, then you can be satisfied, you know. But uh, but if you if if you at all have an opportunity to play for your country, make sure that you give it your full best. And what are you up to these days? I'm involved in a project in uh, in Franschhoek, where uh, in the Western Cape, where we uh, we've got a high performance centre uh, in 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 this beautiful uh, town of Franschhoek. And uh, yeah, we're developing rugby players uh, and and swimmers in this in the valley. So yeah, that's uh, that's what I'm busy with at the moment. Sounds good. I know that you did a little bit of coaching as well. And when I say a little bit, uh, it was maybe a little bit more than that. Uh, obviously, with the Sharks, uh, we I think you were reasonably successful. I think it's fair to say you were involved with the Springboks as well. I remember the Lions, and I think there was also a, a stint that you had in the Netherlands. Is that right? Yeah, I've, uh, I, I coached in Russia. I coached in Russia until the war broke out, and then uh, and then I went and helped in in the Netherlands. Uh, so I didn't really coach in the Netherlands, but uh, I just helped their coaches to develop some structures. But uh, yeah, I've enjoyed the coaching. I mean, it's the next best thing to playing. So uh, you know, to be able to share the knowledge that you have, and and uh, and you never stop learning as a coach, uh, and and to be able to uh, get other. Uh, players to to uh, to fulfil their dreams and to you know perform at the best is is what coaching is all about. You know, I'd be fascinated to hear from you uh, in terms of Russia and the Netherlands. What is the sort of rugby structure like in those countries compared to South Africa, for example? In Russia, it's uh, it's a, it's a fast growing sport. They've got ten professional teams. Uh, there's probably sixty uh, odd players that are playing in, in the Russian league in those uh, amongst those sort of 10 professional teams there's probably seven or eight coaches that are coaching over in Russia so so ru uh, rugby is developing fast there a uh, place like the Netherlands uh, the standard of rugby is, is really poor uh, but there's a lot of enthusiasm around it you know so um, we take it for granted that uh, that uh, the standard of rugby that we have here is so high uh, you know, it, it 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 just bodes well for the quality of the players we have here in this country. You know, I don't believe our, our coaching is necessarily the best in the world, but 
I do believe that uh, that we have some of the best players in the world. And I think another thing that most rugby fans would love to see is rugby becoming a truly global sport, right? In in the same way that football is, right? Uh, where FIFA can put on a World Cup with 32 teams and you know that hardly any of them are particularly weak. Uh, for rugby to get to that level, what do you think needs to happen? Well, uh, you know, rugby... rugby will only get there if uh, administratively it, it progresses you know so I, I just think we 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 uh, we we're running behind from an administrative perspective the rugby the game has unfortunately uh, become very uh, complicated with the rule changes and uh, and you know it, the the spectacle of the game is not quite where it was where you know, you're getting a lot of tries being scored and, and a sort of open flowing game. It's a, a lot of it is just the physicality and the, the bashing that gets done. But having said that, uh, you know, there's uh, there's some teams that are playing some great, great rugby around the world. And uh, and I think uh, if, if, if it was developed at a younger age uh, at, in certain countries, there'd be more progress. Uh, but I do believe that... Uh, that the game is uh, unfortunately becoming too complicated from a rules perspective. All right, Dick, it's time for us to take another look at that trivia question. I think that you are definitely going to know the answer to this, but let's take a look at it. Who was South Africa's leading point scorer at the 2011 Rugby World Cup? Do you know the answer, Dick? I think it would be Percy Montgomery. Oh, you know what? Um, that was the 2007 Rugby World Cup. In 2011, it was Mornay Stain. Aha. Uh -huh. Wow. Okay. Okay. Yeah, Mo oh, that's right. Mornay, Mornay overtook Percy. That's quite correct, yeah. You were involved with that Springbok squad, weren't you? I was. I was, yeah, most definitely. It was, uh, it was a little bit disappointing losing to the Aussies the way we did, uh, where... You know, you could still question the, the fact that uh, refereeing has uh, cost us a World Cup, but, but uh, I certainly do feel that uh, there was some dubious refereeing over that time. Absolutely. I think every South African feels that way. Dick, um, I think we're going to have to get you back on Front Row Rugby in the future uh, because I think we could do an entire video just on that uh, Rugby World Cup quarterfinal in 2011. Let me say that it was lovely having you on and thank you very much for your time. Pleasure, man, and good luck and keep it going. Last time on Front Row Rugby, I had legendary Springbok wing Tondurai Chavanga on the show. You can go and have a look at that video. It's appearing on your screen right now. Next time, we'll have 1995 Rugby World Cup winner Yapi Mildred here. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed that video, why not spear tackle the like button? You can also subscribe and hit the notification bell so you don't miss any content from Front Row Rugby. See you next time.